Want to advertise your business in a cost-effective way? It's time to give podcast advertising a try. Research shows a high rate of podcast listeners made a purchase as a result of an ad they heard on a podcast. Visit podbean.com slash brands to launch a cost-effective podcast advertising campaign in minutes. That's P-O-D-B-E-A-N dot com slash brands. Hello and welcome to episode 74 of the world's first Paul Weller fan podcast. I'm Dan Jennings and 10 years ago I gave up my live stream and career as a radio presenter with one big regret. Never getting to interview my hero, the legendary British musician Paul Weller. This podcast exists purely to solve that issue. Welcome to Desperately Seeking Paul. And as a little post-Christmas treat, we have three new podcasts this week, each with a different honorary counsellor. We've already heard from the fabulous Kamel Hines. So next up, another bass player who played with the Style Council, Chris Bostock. Musician, songwriter and music producer known for his work with Joe Boxers, Subway Sect, Dave Stewart, The Excerts and Stingrays. And another fabulous honorary counsellor who played on that incredible debut album, Café Blur. If you love the Style Council, you're going to love this one. Let's get into it. My guest, Chris Bostock. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for inviting me. This whole thing for you started at like a ridiculously young age, didn't it? Well, music, yeah. Age of six, learning the piano, basically, and then taking to the guitar at 12. And then punk came along and I was desperate to get in a band. So I ended up playing bass because the other guy in the band couldn't. So, he, you know, we were both guitarists. So I, I, I went to bass and we had this band called the Stingrays and we played everywhere in Bristol played Bristol to death basically and then was in another band called the Excerts who were kind of clash with reggae thrown in and then you know the big break came really when Bernard Rose recruited a bunch of us from Bristol to go and to be the new subway set but really to be his house band at his rehearsal rehearsals complex in Camden what was it that made you love this type of music I mean a really exciting period as well for, for young music wasn't it yeah it was because it came at the end of that string of musical styles and youth cultures from punk to new wave to ska to new rockabilly to new romantic we came in as subway set with Vic Goddard about then and we didn't want anything to do with new romantic so we invented this new scene that we call cool bop and swing it's quite jazzy and influenced by Gershwin and Cole Porter and a lot of the 60s Georgie Fame that kind of thing that music wouldn't have sounded out of place on the Style Council's Cafe Blur so we, you know, we were kind of um, heading in that direction quite early on quite an eclectic mix of music for a young man to be diving into and listening to it was that like something that was um, given to you by your parents and that your upbringing uh, were you a particularly musical family yeah we had a piano and a harmonium one of those church organs that you could pedal and the <laughs> wind would go through the pipes and you could um, had a swell pedal to make it louder extended family played cello as well and so yeah there's lots of guitar piano and, and various things going on in the house I had these older brothers of course and um, at least 10 years older than me so I, I was brought up on this diet of the Beatles and the Stones and Motown classical you know it, it was it was around us all the time and how did the parents react to the love of punk then was that a, <laughs> was that a popular thing with them or no, I'm guessing not <laughs> uh, they, yeah they, 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 they were quite I'm positive about it really they, they, they was pleased that I was into something and, and, and doing it with a passion what did punk mean to you so with that, that love of that music and that scene music had become so stagnant by about 1970 or 1976 once punk came through I just loved that because it just broke the way for a whole new wave of bands the jam I picked up on quite early I really liked them and I ended up buying the same guitar as Paul Weller you know, the Rick and Macca 340 this was with an extra pickup it was, a, and it was a great way to get out and do something you couldn't have done that before it was just so boring the whole scene you saw the jam live at Bristol Colson Hall, yeah? It's now Bristol Beacon. Yeah, I saw the jam there. Well, the thing I remember about seeing the jam is, is that it sent tingles down your spine, and I don't think anything else has ever done that. So there's something special about it. I don't know what it was. He was taking on that Pete Townsend slightly aggressive bash the guitar around. You know, you didn't know whether he was going to smash the guitar at any moment, which was quite nice, the tension that that brings. Uh, yeah, one of the first angry young men. He, he and Joe Strummer, probably. And... um yeah, it was it was electrifying watching watching that particular show. I mean, we used to go and see everything that came through. The, the, we, there was the Bristol Locarno every week. We go down there and we we saw all those bands that came through. The Clash, you know, and Susie and the Banshees, all, all the early ones, and and later too. Everyone would go there once a week. You mentioned Subway Sets and the band that you um, you were in. And and first of all, am I right in thinking your first tour 
was with the Bureau, which features Merton Mick, Mick Talbot, Star Council. Was that right? And that was our first, yeah, our first tour. Yeah, we, let, we got let loose for the first time and went crazy on that tour. And we got to know Mick really well. And Pete Williams was a good guy that we know to this day. And he's just played on our new album by Subway Set. Mick was great fun. He's got this sense of humour. One night after, um, I think up north somewhere, went to the local park in the middle of the night, all of us, after the, all a bit crazy after the gig, both bands. And, and we managed to get all the boats loose and we went out it's in the middle of this lake with on all these boats. It was like an, an armada of mad, <laughs> mad young guys. Yeah, Mick was amazing. We used to watch his... Their, their show was great because, of course, they were the, the original Dexies beforehand. And so we, we used to go and watch their show and they used to come and watch ours. And so there was a lot of mutual admiration. I think they liked that what we were doing because it was different. And certainly Mick came down when we were recording Subway Set. We got this deal with London Records. And we recorded the Songs for Sale album with Vic and... Um, Mick came down and I was playing electric bass and double bass and he took a great interest in what we were doing. Interesting. Well, we'll come on to the connection with the Style Council in a second as well. But in terms of the jam, how did you feel 1982 when Weller calls it a day? I had everything, I had all their albums. I, I followed them completely. And I understood, fully understood what Paul Weller was doing because I could see he was in a straight jacket and he wanted to do soul and funk and Motown. And he, he wasn't going to sound like that if he was with the jam. And he, he was going in the same direction that we were going in because when Vic left us, with Subway Set, we got Dig Wayne in instead to form Joe Boxers. And that's when we started doing the, the funk and the soul and, and, and the northern. And we all start, we started writing our own songs. So that was a really big moment for us. Right. And I can see that the style counts were going in that same direction. We should talk, as a bass player, I would be remiss of me not to mention Bruce Foxton. Was that somebody that you looked at his styles and just kind of were, were blown away as a fan of the jam as well? The great thing about Bruce, he actually played on my wife's album. He played my wife's band. She was with a band called The Rhythm Sisters. And made a few albums and um, so I got to know him through through that later on and the great thing about his playing is that if you isolate his playing in the mix you know it's Bruce Foxton there aren't many people you can do that with there's James Jameson there's Bootsy Collins probably and John Entmussel maybe but with Bruce it's definitely you know you know straight away that's Bruce Foxton playing you're always that plectrum that, that twangy sort of fiddly stuff that he does a few people have mentioned the fact that because initially he was like a rhythm guitarist or lead guitar in the jam and then they swapped it round and yeah. some people have said like the, the way he plays bass is because of that kind of like attacking yeah. the attacking the instrument yeah he's a good guitarist uh, and certainly yeah certainly he, he, he plays with very much with a pick you can hear that straight away let's talk about joe boxes so you mentioned how that comes about and i mean pretty quickly this is a big success isn't it yeah very much so we, we, we've been well rehearsed for such a long time we've done tour after tour after tour I and mean, we were just itching and ready to go and what had happened is vic met the love of his life and didn't really want to be on tour anymore and he stopped turning up to shows and we were in the middle of a big tour and so we, we did this huge show at the Manchester Apollo I think it was called something else back in the day and um, no Vic so we said right we're going to deal with this and so we all sang we, we took turns doing the, all the chants chanting out all the choruses and things and everyone went crazy and, and we thought we don't need him anymore <laughs> it's, it's actually gone down better without him so we wanted something here and uh, we asked Bernard Bernard Rhodes our manager who was obviously the, the Clash manager and he launched Dexies and the specials and we said to him can you find us a singer because this is you know itching to keep going and so he went off to New York and recruited Dig Wayne from Buzz and the Flyers brought him over and of course it, it gelled immediately because Dig is such a talent brilliant singer a brilliant lyricist and he brought out and versatile too so he brought out the best of us and all of a sudden we started writing as a, as a group all of us wrote and all these songs started to happen and that whole album came together in a, in a few months what would you put your finger on of that chemistry and and you know when it works how do you know it works everything just suddenly falls into line I mean, I think it's because we all worked together as a team. It was very much teamwork and it all worked. We, you know, it was no sort of... With Vic, he, he was, the, you know, he would bombard us with songs and he was the main songwriter. We were all writing together suddenly and it, it, mm. it worked as a team. So as soon as you've got that chart of success, Box the Beat goes straight to, I think it's into the charts where we get up to number three and you're all like playing Top of the Pops and you, you know, we're on the front cover of Smash Hits and Enemy and Melody Maker and, um, you know, Sounds would have been around then and Record Mirror and all that. How does that feel? That must be insane for young man it all happens very quickly yeah you have to manage your time carefully you don't get much time to think about it you just you just add it to your workload and get on with it but yeah the one I really remember was yeah was, was NME front cover of NME because that, that meant something to us Adrian Thrills was the journalist and I forget who took the photo but there was a big picture of us doing a kind of rugby scrum and it was there on the front cover and we thought yeah now it's happening what followed was Melody Maker Sounds and Smash Hits and all those number one all those magazines kept going after that we were both at the event of few weeks back with about the Style Council and when I, I got to chat to Mick Talbot once again um, and Tracy 
was saying about being on top of the pops and how you had to mime and you had to like pre-record a backing track and things. Did you have to do that as well or did you get to perform live? This pre-recording the backing track, um, it was a, a musician's union thing, wasn't it? That, that, that everyone had to re-record it. It was just a way of making sure that session players got paid for doing sessions. It was just an ancient sort of law that had gone back decades. And so there was this nonsense where you go in and record and then you swap the tape over. So you, you give them the proper record to play at the last minute and this, presumably they'd turn a blind eye. You know, but occasionally people got caught out and, 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 and the sort of rubbish recording that they'd done got used. And you can tell on top of the pops, you know, they've, they've been caught out and it's, it hasn't sounded too good. On top of the pops, of course, one week you'd record it about five o'clock and it'd go out a couple of hours later. And then another time it'll be a live broadcast. It literally, you're on anything that happens. That, that's it. Oh, right. It? Wow. You did. I think the fourth time we were on there, we we're doing just got lucky and we were booked to play Aberdeen the same night. And we're doing this live broadcast at seven o'clock and we're supposed to be on stage in Aberdeen about, about 10 30 or something. The good old record company took care of that because we just, as soon as we, come off the stage we jumped in a, a fast car that took us to Northolt where we jumped in a helicopter that took us to what was it Luton or somewhere and then we hopped in a private jet that took us up to Aberdeen and we actually and I got the roadies to do the sound check and then we yeah we, we walked on at 10 10 30 in Aberdeen that's amazing <laughs> Ah, although it sounds quite stressful as well, I'll be honest with you. And that one just got lucky. I mean, again, um, a top 40 hit. You co-wrote that one as well, didn't you? That's right. Yeah, with Dig, Wayne. Yeah. And um, and goes top 10, goes international too. It did top 40 in the US. And of course, it was used in the 40-year-old Virgin and Lindsay Lohan's Just My Luck movie, where it's the opening track that opens the, the movie. As we're here, it's the Paul Weller fan podcast. We really should talk about this beauty. So Cafe Blur, the Style Council's debut album. There you are on a couple of tracks. How did the link with the Style Council come about? I don't know. Is it a competitive thing in music where you're, you know, because ultimately, yes, you might be mates, but you're also competing for chart position at the same time, aren't you? Well, yeah. I mean, they had... Speak Like a Child was released and then we released Boxer Beat and Boxer Beat went to number three and then they released Money Go Round and we released Just Got Lucky that got to number six and then later on they, they had Long Hot Summer and exactly the same time we put out Johnny Friendly so it was exactly the same time we were, we were in the charts no there wasn't rivalry at all no it, it was great to have you know to be part of a, a scene where other people are doing you know similar things it, it keeps you going and of course we've been on a crash course to meet way before that I think because we used to run Club Left in 1981 in Soho's Whiskey A Go Go before it became the, known as the WAG we used to it used to be the backing band the house bands for all these different singers and it was all in the style of Café Bleu you know, and so obviously Mick knew about that you know both bands were heading in the same direction for some time so so when I finally got the, the call to you know to go and play on that album it didn't seem a huge surprise really and what was it you thought what did you make of it I mean it's very different sound to the jam as somebody who loved that music but it sounds like music from your taste so you were kind of heading in a similar direction anyway but what did you make of those first few singles yeah yeah I loved them yeah I really did like them a lot because yeah. they were trying to achieve the same thing we were trying to achieve to go in that sort of funky soul Motown northern soul kind of direction you can you can hear all the influences in there and of course I know Paul Weller was a huge fan of, of soul singles and of course we were too and in fact our first album like Gangbusters is really just an album full of singles you know we were writing for singles rather than to be an album and their their singles stand out very individually all the style council one one thing that was kind of relevant was that when we did club left we took it to paris and there was a big paris paris connection with cafe bleu and the coffee cappuccino kids and the coffee bars and things like that so there was, there was an awful lot in common early on well the, the, the thing i love thing i love about french music i love that um all the debussy and the poulonk and the sarty you know that that I always thought of that as being the, the musical version of all the impressionist paintings that were around around at the same time. Monet and Manet and Matisse was it, and so it's, it's definitely um, a romantic place, France. I mean, that first album is very diverse, really different. I mean, must have been terrifying for the record company when they get it and realise that Paul's barely on two tracks. I think on the first side, and um, we have to talk about the tracks that you're on. Let's kick off with the one that you recorded first. So here's one that got away, which is side two, track four. Here's one that got away. Uh, tell me about how that came about. He played me that track it straight away I, I clocked you know you, he wanted it to be like a walking skipping northern soul bass he wanted you know he knew I did a lot of walking bass so I immediately thought of Spiral Staircase more today than yesterday which was one of my favourite northern soul songs and I, so, I, so I got into that kind of groove for part of it I think that's the verse and then for the chorus part of it it, it was obviously it was like um, I can't help myself by the four tops but instead of going dun, 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 it was dun, 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 like a skip northern soul beat and so 
I got the two parts and locked them together. Yeah, and it worked, and he was really happy with that. Where did you record that? Was it Solid Bond? That was in Solid Bond, yeah, yeah. It, it was I mean, right in the middle of the summer. I remember when I turned up, there was a bit of lawn outside, and he was uh, Paul was sunning himself on the lawn and looking really brown. <laughs> I that before we went in, and he was very interested in the Joe Watts' writing process. And how did it feel? What was the vibe like? Because you get the impression that, I mean, he's talked about that first three years of the Star Car bits all being the most fun he's ever had in his, his music career. Did it feel like that kind of environment? Yeah, he wanted to have fun, but he knew exactly what he what he wanted at the same time. You know, you could tell him. I can't imagine him being, you know, having a good belly laugh. He's a, he's a, he's a pretty serious sort of guy, isn't he? So you know all the time, you know, he's basically an angry young man at heart, isn't he? What goes on in his head is just, sounds like a magical thing because you're right, he's very clear about exactly what he wants and where he wants it and how it should work. And from talking to other guests, it seems like there are very few... Um, there are very few takes on stuff. It's not like, do you know what I mean? Like the hit rate of kind of getting it right in the first few takes and then going, yeah, that's it. We nailed it. What was in my head is now a reality. It's incredible. I think it's remarkable. Yeah, I think he's got a fantastic vision. He's certainly uh, prolific. I always think that, that hard work in um, morale it could come from his dad, probably, isn't it? You know, he's a hard working, working class guy. I can, you know, he just seems like a, a workaholic, really. Uh, so let's talk about the second track that you recorded then, Paris Match. This is not Paul Weller on vocals, not DC Lee on vocals but Tracy Thorne from Everything But The Girl on vocals um, how did that come about? Well he, he said you know I heard you can play some double bass you know because obviously Mick had come down and seen us recording the Subway Sex album so I said yeah well, you know he said you want to give it a go I said yeah why not let's just it, you know it wasn't too serious let's have a go and see how it turns out sort of thing Mick was really useful because he knew the arrangement and he was obviously calling out the, the different parts and co- coaxing me through it yeah we did a few takes and it turned out fantastic I mean they were really happy with it and um, I lose track of the number of people I bump into and they say that's the best Soul Council track ever not not that song but that particular version of it and they don't realise I've played on it it has a sort of um, haunting ghostliness about it and it's a little bit dangerous which that's what I really like about that song it really jumps out when it comes on on the album it's like wow here it comes again and presumably Tracy wasn't in the room at the time recording with you was she it wasn't like a live no, session no. No. so that came later that all came later did yeah. you know that she would be the one singing that version I'm just I think she I think there may have been a guy vocal on there I just can't remember to be honest I can't remember such a long time ago it was a you know a pleasure to have done it I'm, I'm pleased they asked me you know it's brilliant I'm, what can I say you know <laughs> it's weird because you mentioned about this the kind of parallels between Joe Boxers and Style Council but the Joe Boxers comes to an end fairly soon after that well like a couple of years after that um, that's right yes what yeah. is it just fizzle out or did you all well, kind of have a big bust up and no you know, not at all. Two major events caused it to break up. Right, right at the beginning, our manager Bernard Rhodes, we got we got signed to the RCA record deal, and immediately um, Joe Strummer insisted that he goes back with the Clash again. So he went back to manage the Clash, and suddenly he wasn't there. He was in the states, and just when we needed him most, he, he was gone. So we we got a, a friend in to manage us. He did a good job, but he wasn't you know an experienced manager. And then things were going well with the record company under the A and R man Jack Stephen. He was he worked with the Eurythmics as well. And after a year, he suddenly left and went to CBS. So suddenly we were out without uh, our A and R man who had been really good. And he was our, our key link with the record company. And so some people will tell you that if you lose your A and R man, it's the kiss of death. And it, and it really was because it just the relationship just went down from then on. It really needed somebody there that was interested. Once that person's gone, there's no one else to take their place. You know, everyone's got their own bands they want to sign, kind of somewhere you really don't want to be. So we tried to get out of that deal for a while and wasted a lot of time doing that and time that couldn't be, you can afford to be doing that really. We need to put our creative energies into music, not into business. And so, yeah, so when we finally got out of that deal, our brilliant guitarist Rob Marsh paid for us to go in and record another album so so this, the second album didn't get released by RCA so we thought who cares we'll go and record another one so we recorded a third one the, a big chunk of that was recorded and we found a new manager and he was shopping it around and we had a, a deal on the table with a a smaller label a good one but a smaller one and two of the band didn't want to go with a a smaller label they wanted another major we were all a bit tired out after all the sort of legal wranglings and things so it kind of just separated then about January 1986 we, right. we just split in half basically and 
and the other th- three of us went off and did Sandy Shaw and the other two went and worked on Dick's solo career. Back together now again. So we're talking, what, 35 years, something like that, is it? And as the old saying goes, let's get the band back together. We were hoping for live shows this year. They've now moved into 2022. So what's prompted that? What got you all back together? There was always somebody that didn't want to do it. That was the problem. Was that most of us wanted to do it. And there's always someone that didn't. And it's a different person each time. And um, <laughs> finally, right. Well, you just changed your mind. Some of you like, yeah, no, now I'm the one that's going to be a pain in the bum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So eventually we just managed to, you know, managed to agree. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So, I mean, that's a long time to be off the scene. So, and I'm guessing you were like properly excited about 2021 and getting back playing live again. And now COVID and stuff's forced it all into next year. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. But what's remarkable is that we were the original band, whereas a lot of these 80s bands that are playing the festivals, there's just maybe, you know, maybe it's just the singer or one original member and there's just a bunch of session players. So it's not the real thing, but this is the real thing. So I, I think that's quite exciting. We've got a, a big rehearsal session, but you know, about a week of rehearsing before. And so we're going to do all the, all the, the, all the best of what we used to do. And, and a few that never got released as well. Not too many, just a few that never got released that we think are brilliant and people should hear. If when we do the festivals, it'll be shorter set. It'll be about 30 minutes, 40 minutes maybe. But when we do the, the shows, it'll be a bit more than that. We'll actually get to do some of these songs that have not been heard that we think should be big hits. And am I right in thinking there's going to be a very best of LP next year as well? That's right. Cooking Vinyl have been brilliant. They're, they're going to release Essential Boxer Beat which has been released before, but this is a better version. This has got all, all the hit versions on it. This is coming out on the 24th of June, before just before the tour. We talked Joe Boxers. Let's also talk Subway Sect. Talk about spinning plates, my friend. There's a lot going on with you, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well, a couple of years ago, just before COVID, we recorded an album produced by Mick Jones of The Clash with you know with Vic. So it's, it's called Moments Like These by Subway Sect. And it's obviously been put off because of the um, pandemic. It's now available for download. And the CDs will be available in the new year. They've been held up also by the pandemic. So it's been released just as uh, there's been a special edition US version of it, which has come out on limited vinyl. But the main CD and album of it will be out hopefully uh, in the new year. How did it feel to be back with Vic again after all that time? Well, we've been touring with him um, for the last couple of years. Back in 2014, we did Club Left 2014 at the 100 Club, which was basically the original band and Vic. And then we did... Club left 2016 at the Glasgow Jazz Festival, and, and, and these were both huge sellouts. So that encouraged us to, to do some more work. So we, we got together properly with Vic and, and did a couple of tours. And then, of course, you know the pandemic came along, and nothing much has happened since then. Yeah, yeah. There's one other connection with the Style Council that I'm aware of. There might be others, but um, Steve Rapport, good friend of the podcast. Bless you, Steve. Always promoting it, always helping us find new listeners to the show. He was the main photographer for the Joe Boxers. Obviously, Snap the Style Council, which is the conversation that I had with Steve on the podcast as well. How did that connection come about? Because that was a similar time as well, wasn't it? He was working for both of you. That's right, at the same time. Yeah, that was another thing in common I forgot to mention yeah Steve Rapport he was fantastic he did all our photos and he did I think most of the Style Council ones and of course the, the other thing in common we had was that we both played Gary Crowley's Bogarts Club which was <laughs> in, up in Harrow on a Thursday night and he used to have these uh, PAs where you just got up and sort of mimed to the record but we didn't have instruments so you know what happened P- people would just get up there and dance or you know, do handstands or anything they would just they'd just sort of stand up on the stage while the record was played it's quite a funny concept <laughs> I think it must be unique to Gary. But so I went and saw the Style Council doing it, and the next week it was us doing it. Oh, brilliant. When would that have been? So what period of Style Council would that have been? At the very beginning, about eight, about mid-83. Right, okay. Oh, right, so properly early on. Oh, funny. Mm. And what, so nobody's playing any instruments? So, so Whitey's not on the drums, Mick's not on the keys or anything like that? They just... We literally stand up on the stage and, and, and wander <laughs> around. And When I did it, I just did press-ups on... <laughs> That's an amazing concept. I can't imagine yeah. that. How is that billed? As a like, how are you selling that as a thing for fans to come and watch? <laughs> like, I guess it's a personal appearance of sorts. <laughs> yeah, that's so funny. I had not, I had not heard of that. I'm, that's a brilliant thing. I love that. Um, and what have you made of Weller's solo career? So we're now talking about, I mean, thirty years that eclipses the time of the Jam and the Star Council. An amazing back catalogue over the past thirty years since we had that first solo album through to Fat Pop Volume One. What have you made of all that? In awe of his vision and determination, I'm sure everyone is you know he's he spawned this whole culture of, of authors and uh, tribute bands and you know there's a, there's a whole community of people he's left in his wake i like what he's done i, I love his music it's um 
he's managed to follow his dream, hasn't he? No, oh, absolutely, totally. So post Joe Boxers, you mentioned Sandy Shaw. So what happened then, career wise, over the past thirty five years? What have you been up to? Well, we did Sandy Shaw, and then I did um, Spear of Destiny, an album and tour, and um, I did some sessions. Shakespeare's sister, I did their, one of their singles. I, I joined a band called The Flame, a, a brief band, brand new band with um, Paul Thompson, the drummer from Roxy Music, and Dave Winthrop, who was the sax player from Super Tramp and Secret Affair. And we were signed to Dave Stewart's record label. And But before that could take off, the, the rhythmic split up, and Dave asked me to join his new band, and he's calling it the Spiritual Cowboys. That turned into three years of touring around Europe and two albums that went gold in France. That was a really busy time, that was. That was just uh, non-stop for three years, TV promos and touring and al- album recording. You mentioned about the vision of well. I mean, I imagine Dave Stewart's somebody who's fairly you know, pretty visionary as well. I mean, I've seen him interviewed. I remember he, when Ghost the Musical came out, he'd written the soundtrack, and I got an invite to Abbey Road to watch him being interviewed. And again, he seems like a man who, A, is comfortable experimenting in terms of his music, but also like, really clearly knows what he wants to, to make. Absolutely, yeah. He's amazing, um, the, the amount of ideas he has. And the, what's amazing about Dave is that he, I, I had this nickname I used to call him multi-mind because he could do so many different things at once so we'd be recording in one studio and then in the next studio he'd be mixing the Eurythmics greatest hits and then in another studio he'd be making some promos and another one he'd be doing a documentary and then he had his record company over the road his management company down the road and and it it was juggling all these things at the same time. This has been brilliant, Chris. Thank you so much for your time. I have two final questions for you. Um, as a listener to the podcast, you may know what's coming. So spoiler alert, but let's see how we go. Um, you're allowed one Paul Weller song for the rest of your life. It can be the jam, the style council or solo. What are you going to go with? Um, Ever changing moods. Oh, why that one? I don't know. <laughs> I just really like <laughs> Which version? I like the single, yeah. Final question. Purpose of this podcast is not least to meet lovely people like yourselves who've had these connections with Paul over the years and to tell their stories, but it's also to get the interview with Paul Weller that I never managed during my radio career. Desperately Seeking Paul is the podcast. If it happens, what should I ask him? Is there anything you'd like to know? Mm, I'd, I'd ask him, when was the first moment he knew that he was going to be a professional musician? Because it may have clicked with him from as early as five years old. Some people know, don't they? I think think I knew from the age of six. And I wonder what how old was he and, and what that moment was like. That's what I'd ask him. That's a great question, yeah. And what was it for so six years old? I mean, my eldest is seven. I can't imagine him in his head going, do you know what, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I love it so much. Actually, he does want to be a paleontologist. He loves dinosaurs. But yeah, six years old, what was it that really connected with you music and you thought, actually, yeah, this is going to be my life? Well, I was playing the piano and I was listening to Motown and the Beatles and all those 60s groups and I was just immersed in it completely and I couldn't imagine doing anything else. Uh, This has been so lovely, Chris. Thank you so much for your time, man. I really, really appreciate you coming on. Uh, Good luck in 2022. Live, Joe Box is back. We'll put all the details in the show notes for this podcast as well. I imagine you can't wait to get started back on that project again. I can't wait. Thanks, Dan. It's been, been great being here. Thanks for inviting me along. Well, there you go. Always great to hear from another honorary counsellor on this podcast. My thanks once again to Chris Bostock for joining me. You can find out more about Chris and the return of Joe Boxers on my website, paulwellerfanpodcast.com. And don't forget, there's another new episode coming tomorrow with yet another honorary counsellor. So make sure you follow wherever you get your podcasts. If you've enjoyed this episode of the podcast, please do share on your social media channels. And don't forget, you can also buy me a coffee and find all the episodes of the podcast on my website, paulwellerfanpodcast.com. I'll see you next time.